Uh, thank you, and uh, good morning. Are you inferring a causal relationship between somebody holding up a card and what a speaker yeah. does? <laughs> Dream on. Physical, yeah. So um, it's a long way from uh, L.A. to Washington, um, and while I was sitting in seat 11D, I thought about uh, what I might uh, talk about uh, today. I was asked to uh, sort of give an overview of how we got to where we are now, I think, uh, thinking that somehow I represented the past of uh, causal inference, I've arrived. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about causal inference and uh, risk assessment, describe some of the evolution, truly going uh, back. Uh, those of you who took Epi 1 anywhere may see a familiar slide or two. Uh, and I, I will say, across my uh, career of teaching public health and epidemiology, one of my favorite ways to torture students has been to ask them to define what a cause is. I know if I pointed to anybody in this room, perhaps except for a philosopher or two, you would blanch if I put you to the uh, test. And then I'm going to talk about the challenge of uh, these new data streams, uh, in part from uh, my role over the last couple of years of chairing this uh, committee that issued the report on 21st century science in, uh, in January. So, uh, and I also want us to be very clear about the difference between decision making and causal inference and causal inference for decision making. I think they tend to get uh, mixed up. So in terms of thinking about how we make decisions in environmental health, we've already heard this. We use all the data there is and decide if there's a problem, hazard identification and risk assessment parlance. And if the answer is no, we decide the evidence is insufficient or perhaps there's an indication of safety, we might quit. And if the answer is yes, uh, we go on to address the question of how much risk, bring in quantification, and again, epidemiology and toxicology partner there, and uh, we may do a quantitative risk assessment, at least in some uh, settings, to decide what uh, to do. And uh, of course, this has been put together historically. I think Kim already mentioned the Red Book, 1983. It lives on, and then more recently, the so-called Silver Book, which elaborated uh, on the concepts of the Red Book, as have other uh, reports. The Red Book, of course, offered this uh, four-element framework, hazard identification, dose response, exposure assessment, and risk characterization. And in, uh, you might think about replacing hazard identification with uh, causal inference and judging whether an agent is linked to um, a disease. I think going back to the last presentation, I think we should keep in mind the difference between does agent X cause disease Y from, I think, what else I heard in the opening remarks, what are all the causes of disease Y and how do they work together? And that's a far different matter in, uh, in, in my mind, of course, of, of broad importance, but uh, a far more complicated question generally than does X cause Y. And this next step of uh, quantification is, uh, harkens back to a 1953 paper by Levin, who uh, published what is now the attributable, what we now call the population attributable risk. He wrote a paper in 1953 that should be read by those interested in risk assessment. He had done one of the 1950 publications, case control studies on lung cancer. And in 1953 wrote, I, I think that smoking causes lung cancer. And if we think something causes a disease, then the next thing we want to know is how much disease does it cause? Very logical. And he uh, wrote this paper with this uh, statistic that essentially underlies uh, our burden estimation still. This is the picture of the Department of Epidemiology at Hopkins in uh, somewhere in the 30s. I was chair from uh, 94 till 2008, and I was commented the faculty was much better dressed in the past than when I took uh, over. Uh, there was one woman in the faculty at the time, the first. So then we turn to this question of causal inference uh, for uh, what? Uh, and first off, in sort of traditionally in public health, to identify determinants of disease etiology as a basis for intervention. Smoking causes disease. Let's do something about it. Uh, in our more contemporary context, as an element of quantitative risk assessment, a basis for decision making. And there comes this question of what level of evidence is needed for decision making, something I'll return to. 
And then also to identify critical uncertainties, which become targets for uh, research. And uh, to quote from the uh, 2000, uh, this is actually, sorry, the 2004 report of the Surgeon General, the reason that causal conclusions are so important is they have this notion that if we change the risk factor, something will happen to the uh, disease burden. We're making a firm commitment, uh, I think, in fact, to the, this proposition and saying it is correct. So how do we get to the 21st century where we are? So this question of what is a cause is certainly um, an old one. Uh, one of my greatest disappointments in life was freshman philosophy, which I thought would enlighten me. Sorry, Richard, but instead it bored me. And uh, philosophers, of course, are still debating. But much of the ideas of causation in epidemiology at least go back to uh, Hume and uh, very ideas that were straightforward, like temporality, the cause must come uh, before the effect. We're usually pretty certain about that, but I think this becomes a complication in some of our thinking about uh, pathways. And then this word I know we'll hear a lot today from the modelers, the uh, counterfactual, and thinking about this issue about of what would have happened but for the um, exposure, and uh, this underlies a lot of the ideas of uh, causal estimation. This is my favorite example of the counterfactual. Basically, all sports casting is counterfactuals. This, you know, the Red Sox would have won the World Series had they not finished in last place kind of uh, stuff. And this is uh, just one that caught my attention uh, reading about a football game. And you can see, but make the three field goals they missed and get a few other breaks. And the Terps, that's the University of Maryland, uh, would have been sailing into the fourth quarter with a safe lead. In other words, if there had been a game that had not been, they would have been ahead. And that's what the counterfactual is about. Don't let the pre presenters who follow me confuse you. Just remember this. So need for causal principles in health goes back to the identification of microbes, germ theory, uh, and cock is a, uh, and uh, bacteriology. Uh, he, with Henley, elaborated a set of principles that were useful for dealing with this problem of identifying microorganisms. We sort of have this problem back now with the finding of microbial DNA or RNA in human tissues and interpreting its uh, role in disease uh, causation. So we had these postulates that were working pretty well. And then the disease picture changed. Infectious diseases began to drop sharply. That's the uh, green, uh, green line at the beginning of the 20th century. And the so-called non-communicable diseases rose. And you can see the line for uh, lung cancer in men. The blue one going up, let's see, I guess that works from the uh, 30s here, which certainly caught the attention of uh, those concerned with uh, public health. Epidemiological uh, studies were done. Of course, no one could do experiments to see what caused lung cancer. So this did not fit with the existing Henley Koch uh, paradigm. There was a great deal of discussion in the literature about what to do with this new causal problem across the 50s and into the 60s and beyond. I think there were a couple of crystallizing events. One was the 1964 Surgeon General's report on smoking and health. Uh, it was done by an advisory committee, which is here. Uh, this is Luther Terry, the Surgeon General. This is the group of people who did the work. They essentially did a massive systematic review, wrote a 330-page report, elaborated causal criteria that uh, remain in, uh, in use, and of course reached the conclusion that smoking caused lung cancer. Actually, the stated conclusion was in men because the women the data for women were quite limited at the time. And then, it's 1965, Sir Austin Bradford Hill published his paper, uh, widely cited still, that had very similar uh, guidelines for causal inference. And here's his um, paper. There's a famous last sentence in this paper that essentially says, uh, all knowledge is always incomplete, but we still need to make uh, decisions. So uh, these are the uh, criteria, uh, guidelines, elaborated in the two reports. There's substantial uh, overlap. I think this issue of plausibility sort of sits in the realm of uh, coherence uh, in my way of uh, thinking about these uh, 
guidelines. They are widely used, so this is just citations to the Bradford Hill paper over time, and you can see that this paper still resonates. It's widely used, widely quoted by those who uh, are out to uh, make causal judgments. Fortunately, it's a little harder to track this uh, kind of citation for the Surgeon General's reports, but they are abundantly quoted on the same issues. My point is that what was done more than 50 years ago now essentially remains in use. So they're embedded, for example, these guidelines in the US EPA cancer guidelines of 10 plus years ago, the IRIS uh, preamble, the IARC preamble, and more. So what was uh, elaborated for non-communicable diseases, these principles um, remain uh, in use and presumably useful because we are still using them. Now, what about the uh, process as we've elaborated it? This is a uh, simple schematic, another set of black boxes, but at the start, uh, research, uh, developing evidence, making observations of people, individuals, groups, human exper experiments, other uh, research, toxicological research, whether uh, whole animal bioassays or in vitro assays, the synthesis of that information in some way that we can capture it, that we can look at it. And now we would use systematic review, perhaps meta-analysis, and think about ways that we might join streams of evidence, uh, human and animal. And this is the domain of systematic review. And then on to this area where we use expert judgment and perhaps our causal criteria or guidelines to make a, a judgment. And here still, we'll hear about other alternatives to a group of people sitting around a table in this building or elsewhere and making judgments. But that's still what we are uh, doing uh, by, and, uh, by and large. Just as a reminder, these uh, guidelines worked well for tobacco smoking. And I'm just going to race through in a way to show you how easy it was to get started with the example of smoking and lung cancer and other diseases. Exposure should precede effect. That was certainly easy for uh, tobacco. People smoke for a long time and then get lung cancer. And then strength of association. Stronger associations more likely to be causal in part because other explanations can be set aside. And again, just going back to some of the earliest uh, studies, you can see how strong the association of smoking with lung cancer was. In fact, uh, some of these studies, like Winder, Graham, Dahl Hill, were done before the odds ratio was actually described. So these measures of association were not in the original articles, but very strong um, associations. Uh, there's dose response and consistency. And again, here's dose response from the uh, British doctor study, rising lung cancer mortality with more cigarette smoke per day. This is something I put together for the uh, litigation by the state of Minnesota against the tobacco industry. These are the results of about 70 epidemiological studies showing a relative risk for lung cancer compared with never smokers. Here's an example of the counterfactual, uh, the comparison to never smokers as though this would have been the experience of those who smoked had they not smoked. Uh, but here again, uh, dramatically increased risks. Few things increased disease risk 40-fold. Uh, consistent evidence of rising risk, and I would say that here we see evidence of dose response, strength, and consistency across the studies. And then consistency on replication, again, back to that. Uh, now, this is a meta-analysis of the data on passive smoking and lung cancer. Here the exposure is being married to a smoker. The comparison is being married to a never smoker. These are relative risks of lung cancer in women who have never smoked themselves. You can see a range. You can see that the confidence intervals become wide. They become wider as you go to the smaller uh, studies, uh, of course. And the summary estimate here is about 1.25. I bring this up because this is also an association that was 
found to be causal in the 1986 Surgeon General's uh, report in a report from the National Research Council and, in fact, by IARC. So here, in fact, plausibility was an important part of the story. We knew, uh, of course, that secondhand smoke had many of the same carcinogens as uh, mainstream smoke inhaled by smokers. There was knowledge of the mechanisms even then by which smoking caused uh, lung cancer. So what we have is a summarization of the epidemiological evidence. The, I think the decision did not hinge on the position of that bottom point estimate and its statistical significance, but on far uh, broader range of uh, evidence. And of course, here was a very important and powerful uh, conclusion that helped support the move to clean indoor air. Then uh, this was uh, included in the uh, 64 report, what happens when uh, the exposure is removed, something that Hill commented on, and of course, risks uh, go down. And this again, back to the Minnesota trial, uh, shows a number of studies in terms of what happens to the relative risk of lung cancer in smokers compared to those who, uh, compared to those who do not smoke and shows how the risks drop. So, uh, and then of course, biological uh, plausibility, and that's a part of where we are now in thinking about uh, data that describe pathways and lead us to mechanisms. In terms of the uh, tobacco story, mechanism was long held up as a failing of the evidence available. One of my favorite cartoons, these studies are inconclusive. So far, we've only succeeded in giving cancer and heart disease to laboratory humans. Now, the uh, point here is that a lack of plausibility was held up as a counter to the idea of causation by the uh, tobacco um, industry with the argument for sort of a strict mechanistic approach in which somehow the mechanism by which smoking caused lung cancer had to be identified and an animal model developed, and that was the argument for years, really a misuse of the causal framework. But I will say that, as a reminder, these causal frameworks also supply, offer a framework for developing counterarguments as to why causation does not uh, exist. Now, as to strength of evidence, this is uh, something important around uh, decision making. Many factors, of course, figure in the decision making in public health. One is the strength of evidence countered by how uncertain the evidence is. And then, of course, all the other stuff that also plays out into um, decision making. So it's important to be able to say exactly how strong the evidence uh, is. Is the evidence beyond a point at which there's certainty? Sort of if there's sort of equal chance of causation, non-causation, have we gone beyond this point of balance? of equipoise, is that the point at which we need to be for decision making? And how do we describe how certain we are? Do we use our favorite uh, Bayesian uh, approach? Do we use expert judgment? In the Surgeon General's reports, uh, beginning with 2004, we went back and uh, re-standardized the terminology for strength of evidence. And here you can see the uh, scale. The Environmental Protection Agency, in looking at the main, the criteria air pollutants, went to a five-level scale when uh, they revised their approach to developing the National Ambient Air Quality Standards about 12 years ago now, I think, 10, 12 years ago. And so, in any case, it's important to use language that describes what we have and language that can be um, understood. So here is one example of a scale for describing of strength of evidence. Now, I want to go on to sort of our current problem and uh, why we're here today. That is this problem of new, uh, of new data. So I've listed some of the things that we'll be talking about over the day. Uh, exposomics, uh, which others will be describing. Uh, new non-apical endpoints, markers of early disease, pathway perturbation, and so on. The ability to stratify populations by a phenotype uh, and genomics and try and understand within groups in the population that may have varying susceptibility and perhaps varying underlying uh, mechanisms what a role a factor may have in disease production. So we have new challenges, uh, one person, too much data, uh, perhaps my simple uh, summary.
So that brings me just to a quick uh, overview of the report that was uh, released in early January using 21st century science to improve risk-related evaluations. This report uh, followed two uh, important reports, the Toxicity Testing the 21st Century report published in 2007. And this is the report that offered the vision of using pathway analysis, pathway perturbation, and uh, in vitro assays to replace whole animal bioassays, and certainly to fill the many gaps where there will never be um, human epidemiological uh, data. And then the uh, 2012 Exposure Science in the 21st Century Report, which described a, an increasing array of uh, possibilities for characterizing uh, human uh, exposures. So in the, uh, in the report, uh, we uh, tried to both be practical and offer some examples, and this goes perhaps to tomorrow's exercise, about uh, how to use these new technologies in uh, risk assessment. We described a, quote, new direction, not a new, uh, not a new vision, uh, and talked about the use of biological pathways and processes rather than observation of apical responses as, as in the past, and then that this needed to be a very comprehensive approach and one that incorporates the new exposure uh, information. Now, these are four questions that we said need to be uh, addressed in thinking about pathway approaches. And I'll read them because nobody's holding up a sign yet. Who does hold up the sign? You've got plenty. I've got plenty of time, okay. She's, oh, oh really, wow, okay. Uh, so first question, can, I, and can an identified pathway alone or in combination with other pathways when sufficiently perturbed increase the risk of an adverse outcome or disease in humans and then particularly in sensitive or vulnerable individuals? In other words, do we know enough about a pathway to know if it's perturbed that it will lead to something bad? That's what question number one is. Question number two is, do the available data support the judgment that the chemical or agent perturbs one or more pathways linked to an adverse outcome? So number one is, does the pathway lead to something harmful, increased risk? Number two is, do we have evidence that the agent that we are concerned about has perturbed the pathways, the pathway, or pathway? So this is two different and distinct questions where both need to be addressed by evidence. And then how does the response or pathway activation change with exposure? This gets at the quantitative aspects of the pathway perturbation. And then which populations are likely to be the most affected? So this gets at this issue I talked about of population stratification by susceptibility. Okay, so four important questions, all needing to be addressed by data. The first one, the top one, is generic to the pathway. The second one is generic to the, specific to the agent uh, that we are concerned about, uh, as is the third, the dose response issue, and then the fourth is about uh, susceptibility. And Susceptibility might be, I suppose, general or particular, depending on the agent. So we talk about these four questions and the need to bring evidence together to uh, address them. We acknowledge the uh, complexity of uh, what we're trying to do with uh, thinking about pathways, that an adverse outcome might come from multiple mechanisms which have multiple uh, components, and we go through uh, some thinking about this um, in, uh, in the report. Now, then on how to put the evidence together, and this goes back, I think, to sort of the heart of what the uh, workshop is uh, about. Once we have the data, how do we look at it, evaluate it, and decide how complete the evidence is in hand to address the four questions that I showed you. And what is our basis for making uh, judgments? 
So we spent a lot of time uh, talking about this. Paolo Venez, who's in the audience, was a key uh, committee uh, member here. We uh, wrote and rewrote uh, chapters on this uh, multiple, uh, multiple times. And in the end, what we wrote uh, said that we still lack approaches other than expert judgment for this synthesis of uh, information. We said that the Bradford Hill guidelines could be used to help to answer such questions. We struggled over alternatives, uh, but we concluded in the end that guided expert judgment should be used in the near term for integrating diverse uh, data streams for drawing causal uh, conclusions. So what we used to do, we said, let's keep doing it for now. We think this, uh, we said that this is a, a tough problem and one that really uh, has not received enough, uh, enough attention and that we need a way to uh, move forward in coming up with alternative uh, approaches. In this report, uh, as in reports I've been involved with in the last 30 years, I think, we wrote something about the use of Bayesian methods and how they might be helpful for information integration and uh, synthesis. I first was involved in such a report with the Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation Committee Report Number 4, published deep in the 80s. So uh, we still have, uh, ho have hope, but we're not there yet, and we offer a case study of the use of uh, Bayesian approaches. We talked about a research agenda, and perhaps um, the uh, top several uh, bullets here, points, uh, relate to the exercise uh, tomorrow of developing case studies that reflect various scenarios, decision-making, and data availab availability, and that such case studies should be tested with multidisciplinary uh, panels. I confess right now I have to go home this evening, so good luck with the uh, debates uh, tomorrow. I'll look forward to hearing the resolution uh, that we should catalog what we do as we approach these uh, challenges so we can see how expert judgment uh, moves here. I mean, th these expert judgment processes around causation have not been studied as much as they should. And then uh, we talk about looking at uh, using the new tools uh, to uh, incorporate 21st century science into risk assessment, and we mentioned such as Bayesian uh, approaches. So um, we uh, think that in the report that these uh, new pathway-based approaches can be useful now, and in fact, uh, our case studies point to some real-world examples where these uh, methods have already um, proved, uh, proved useful. Uh, clearly achieving this vision, the vision elaborated in the two prior uh, reports, will take time and will be uh, evolutionary. So this is the uh, famous Yogi Berra quote. It's like deja vu all over again. I can imagine uh, a workshop five years from now, 10 years from now, who knows how many years, X years from now, where these same uh, challenging issues are being discussed. There's even uh, more data to uh, synthesize. So um, let's see what happened. But uh, if I can make any prediction today, there will be more workshops. Thanks. Thank